welcome to the ProcureTech podcast, bringing insight and inspiration into how digital technology is shaping our profession. I'm your host, James Meads, tea drinker, expat, and <laughs> definitely not your typical consultant. Welcome to another episode of the ProcureTech podcast and on today's show we're going to walk through with you a digital procurement transformation from the very very start all the way through to after the fact once it's all been implemented and monitoring ongoing your vendor's performance and to do this I've brought onto the show an expert 13 years standing in delivering and implementing procurement transformations and who has a complete holistic overview of the whole process. So to do this synopsis, I would love to welcome onto the show, Mr. Kartik Rama, who also goes by the name, and I love this name, the procurement doctor. Dr. Kartik, welcome to the show. I'm glad to be on the show, James. Thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting me as a guest. Fantastic. Okay, so before we get started, just give us a quick overview of your background so as so the listeners can see what depth of experience you have in this topic, uh, and then we can jump right in. Sure, James. So as you said, I've come with 13 years of experience. It started off with the average procurement guy. I was managing a category into services, and I had a large team who used to do the end-to-end procurement cycle, right, from sourcing to managing the invoice payments and things like that. And that organization luckily took upon a procurement transformation and I was involved as a part of the transformation. And I kind of hit it off from there. I've uh, implemented multiple solutions across a lot of organizations across the globe. And uh, it's been fun. I've never, no two days are the same. So you get to learn a lot about the customers my core USP has been that uh, since I have the procurement background as well as the technology experience, I speak uh, the language of business with the business folks, which is a procurement team. I speak the techn- technical language with the technology folks so that it doesn't sound Greek and Latin to them. So that's what has helped me all through these years. And that's a really good point. And, and it's a point that was also brought up by a, another guest that I had on episode three, Eddie McGeeky, when we were talking about, you know, what data and what analytics can you get from your legacy ERP systems that if you're if you're talking commercial speak to technical people in IT, then you're probably going to get nowhere fast. Um, so while we're on the subject of IT, at what point? should IT be involved in something like this? Should it be at the very, very start or should it be after you've scoped out possible vendors or maybe done sort of a first round of bidding and you sort of shortlisted it down to to, to a, a list of two or three vendors that you want to take forward and do a decent, uh, and do a decent scope with? Well, um, my thought process is you, the sooner you involve IT, the better it is, right, from the stage where you're trying to finalize your business requirements document or your business case, even before the business case, is because you want everybody on the table. You don't want the IT guy to come in the RFP and say, well, our ERP doesn't support this tool or we don't have the server uh, bandwidth. So these kind of issues come up and kind of collapse the entire project. You go six months backward if you end up not involving them. So this is what I've learned in a lot of the projects. One of the projects, during the project, the IT team came back saying that, oh, we don't have a server that size to maintain the integrations between the system. So we were pushed back by three months for them to procure a new server. We don't want that happening on our transformation. So if you'd have involved involved them from the very start, they would have been able to to raise that up front and you could have mapped your scope your your scope of what your your specification around that that's yeah. right and i guess the the same goes for finance as well right i mean if Absolutely. you're if you're if you want to go and spend millions on something and uh, and there's no business case to do it or finance just doesn't have the the capex or the investment to be able to put in there it's uh, I, I guess the same would apply there too that's right so so we've got IT involved at the very beginning. Then the next logical phase then would be to go to the market mm-hmm. and understand really what providers are out there and what are the different solutions that they can offer. 
depending on scope and budget and ultimately what you want it to do and what aspects of the procurement cycle, the, the source to contract cycle, uh, you want to have covered. So do you knowing that there are a lot of market intelligence and, and research companies out there like Gartner or Forrester or, or even Spend Matters um, that, that put this type of intelligence together, do you still think that it's necessary to do an RFI or, or, or can you cut a lot of time out of that cycle by, by just reading their intelligence to be able to have a better idea of what's out there? Well, um, James, I've personally uh, got a lot of value out of these market intelligence reports like that and other stuff. Uh, but for me, uh, each organization is different and the way they uh, work as well doesn't necessarily fit within the best practice or the industry standard all the time. It's definitely good information to sink in, but uh, before the RFI or as a part of the RFI, I, I personally would recommend to have a separate budget for diagnosis. And I'm a big, uh, uh, big, I'm a big, I vouch a lot for diagnostic studies on whether you as an organization are mature enough to take up the transformation. Similarly, uh, your, is your IT infrastructure ready? Is your data in the right place? Do you have the right resources? So you kind of get all this holistic view before taking up the project. And it kind of tells you uh, how, how ready are you to take up the project. And a lot of the uh, studies that you need to do as a part of the diagnostic study is basically you're building your PRD. It comes out of your current policy, the procurement and pro procurement policy, last year's audit gaps, your interviews with different stakeholders that are involved in this transformation, which would include IT, finance, legal folks, all the other teams. And this would kind of give you a holistic view whether uh, is it going to be a heavily customized solution or is it going to be somewhat okay with the standard, things like that. So it kind of gives you uh, overall project planning. It gives you more effectiveness. Basis armed with this information, it's better to get into an RFI or this could be a tool that you're extracting information from the vendors as well to build the diagnostic study. So it could work either ways, but uh, it is essential to have an RFI. So as, essentially then what we're saying is that while it may not be necessary to do, you know, a very basic scouting of, of which vendors are out there in the market, I mean, you can get that from the reports and understand roughly who does what, but an RFI will really deliver the value of identifying what modules or, or, or reports yeah. they have as standard versus which are, which are additional. And that usually, usually is what sort of creeps up the cost. Uh, and, all, and also you raised a, a fantastic point there is if you're going through a digital transformation, the maturity of your organization is going to be vital because to coin one of my favorite phrases, you can't put a Ferrari engine into a Hyundai because it's just not going to work. Absolutely. And there, there's certain situation, James, I've seen where I've recommended the customer after doing a diagnostic study that you don't need a tool. You're okay just doing these three fixes and you can work with this for now because you don't want to achieve the ultimate out of this transformation. So you just do these three changes in your current process, fix your policy, you should be good to go. Maybe once you are up to that level, you can come back and think of the tool. So it may even it may even reveal that an organization needs to take one step back and 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 walk before they can run. I That's guess right. is what you're saying. You have a yeah. huge leadership push saying that I want this delivered before the end of 2020 because I have budget. Okay, whereas you don't have the time or you can't put in the effort to make it happen because you there's a lot of stuff that you need to do on the background. And you're not really ready for it. Not just because the budget is going to expire, you're going to implement a tool. That should not be the precedence of starting a tool in the first place. So I've seen these occasions as well. And when you go out originally to request initial proposals, so inevitably, when you first go out and request proposals, one of the things that usually crops up in something that's highly technical like this with, uh, with, with, with a lot of different mm -hmm. facets is that any buyer is not going to be an expert on this unless they've purchased it before at another company. So in the first stage of, uh, of proposals, you're probably not going to 
take into consideration everything that you want to have in this tool. So is it best then to do a first round to get initial proposals in and then to sort of refine it with a, a shorter list of of vendors that you believe can meet the spec and then sort of drill down into the more intricate detail and and look at the cost and look at what is standard and what is an add-on at a second phase because inevitably when you start out you're not going to be an expert but as as time goes on and you move through the process you're going to have as the buyer you're going to have a greater knowledge of what these different providers can do absolutely it's uh, best to take baby steps start uh, learn to walk before you run and it's better, better to split it across and maybe take out kind of a rollout strategy, have the initial set of requirements, the basic things that uh, would stop your company from not functioning if they're not there. Take care of those first and then look on the add-ons or the feel-good ones as the second phase is the ideal approach to go, to go by. So during the RFP let's say you've done that and you've got it you've done a first round and then you've narrowed it down to to two three four vendors that you want to take through to a a more detailed phase and and have a a solid proposal that is sort of cast iron in terms of being able to as best as you can compare like for like with the with, with with the proposals what are the most common mistakes that are made during that sort of RFP and vendor selection phase? So uh, the common mistakes. In certain areas, I, uh, I see that organizations are thinking of that particular solution as a silver bullet to all their problems. Well, <laughs> there isn't no solution that could fix all your problems. You have to <laughs> keep that in the back of your mind. Okay, uh, That's one thing. If, that if, the, if, the, if, the, if there was, then we'd all be buying shares in that company, uh, absolutely. right? Absolutely. <laughs> so I would own that company in the future. Let's hope that. <laughs> Now, that's one. Another thing is uh, you can't blindly bash on the best practices as well. This is the best practice, so we need to go by that. You need to, it again brings back to the diagnostic piece where whether your organization is mature enough to take on the best practice. Because the best practices in most scenarios are uh, looked at by looking at large organizations or organizations that have been there for a long, long time and they've got a very mature process. So that might might or might not uh completely fit into your current uh, requirement. So we should be ready to be a little flexible. This is for those IT guys who say that we won't do anything apart from the best practice. So you can't take either or approaches where you customize the hell of the system. You think of completely customizing the solution in a manner which it's no longer that solution. It's as a fact a patent of your own company. So these are the two uh, major things that I see. Uh, A few other things is... uh, Few organizations don't uh, even get the uh, resumes of the consultants or the people who are uh, bidding for the for the solution provider, for most on the consulting side. And it's core cool that you at least try and get a feel for the kind of uh, resources that you're going to get as a part of the RFP, just so that you know you're choosing the right supplier, the right uh, consultant for you. That's one. So- mm-hmm. So that's part of the implementation. In, the, in in most cases, you're if you're going for a enterprise level solution, nine times out of ten, you're going to need a, t- a, a a consultant to come and help you implement it. You're not gonna, in most cases, have the in house expertise to do that. Absolutely. I guess is what you're saying. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Whereas whereas if it's something that sits in the cloud, and yeah, if it's something that sits in the cloud, and um, and and it's something that can be sort of working independently of a legacy uh, ERP system, that's that's something completely different. But if you're looking at uh, at a P2P or, or, or S2C purchase to pay or source to contract complete enterprise level solution, uh, absolutely. it's uh, If it's going to integrate with your ERP system, if that's you're fine. running SAP or Oracle or, or JD Edwards or whatever, then it's not something or it's unlikely to be something that your internal IT team, team will be able to do with their, with their in-house resources. That's right. So looking to internal teams, then you, you've, you've got this far and you've shortlisted vendors and you've selected one um, and you've gone through all of the contract approval process. Actually, that's a good point just to as, as an interlude. Going through the contract approval process, how open do you typically find these SaaS vendors to be uh, for negotiation? Is it pretty much black and white, this is my price, or 
or, 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 or is it very open to negotiation depending on length of contract and optional extras and number of users? Well, I've seen uh, a lot of variation based on the region. And, uh, uh, uh -huh, okay. Okay. Uh, in, in certain places, it's pretty much black and white, like you said. Uh, this is the standard license cost. Whatever they play is, they play on the consulting or the, the resource, uh, the implementation cost per se. Okay. And I've seen certain projects, for instance, in the Middle East, where they've drastically reduced a lot of the money because they were expecting the customer to buy an ERP from them. Eventually, so so it all depends. Uh, but okay. in, in yeah. most cases, it is pretty uh, black and white, and uh, it all depends of what future pipeline that uh, that customer might be willing to provide. So it's really a commercial decision yeah. from the SaaS provider based on total customer lifetime value as a pro as opposed to 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 actual you know profit margin that that they've got to negotiate away as a salesperson. That's right. Okay, that's interesting. Interesting. Very interesting. Let's move on then now more towards the actual implementation phase. So you've you've got the contract signed, you're ready to implement. Why is it vital that you have a good person, you know, one of your top performers implementing this? Because with with any type of special project, you see it often in large corporations that it often ends up being someone that doesn't have a role and is maybe surplus to requirements that gets sort of shunted onto special projects. And I don't know, I've always seen that as being a huge mistake for something as strategic as this. Absolutely. So I've seen like you, the experience you've given is most of the administrators are plugged in people who are uh, filing the contracts or uh, switching the invoices from paper to online. So I see these people being put on projects is because they have some time uh, and it's, it's, it's core that you have the right team set up. And uh, this is where we also, if you remember, we did the diagnostics and we did interviews with different folks internally within the organization. That's how, that's kind of identifying the right resource as well. Uh, the best mix that I recommend to my customers is if you have an IT buyer or the IT category manager, it's best to have him uh, as a part of the overall project implementation is because he understands a bit of IT as well. Uh, even from the IT side as well, if you had a legacy system and the guy who was helping you with the functional team members, which are the buyers and the rest of them, having him closer to the project, him or her closer to the project helps a lot to resolve a lot of the communication gap. And uh, leadership is key no matter what. You can't just have the leadership, uh, just an email goes out to him and he approves it without any, no talking to the team, not understanding how how is it going and things like that. So it's ideally uh, the to drive the project results, it should be a top-down approach. To ensure that the execution is happening the right way, we need to have a bottom-up bottom -up approach where the end user is happy with what the solution is provided. So it's a mixture of both top-down uh, and, and bottom-up. And I, I like the point that you made about the IT buyer because uh, or the IT category manager because not only the reasons that you mentioned, but also... The, the obvious one as well is that you would hope that they have a good relationship with their stakeholders in, in IT so that you're not then just putting a complete stranger onto a project that has no rapport or personal relationship with uh, personal relationship sounds bad, doesn't it? I don't mean it in that way, but <laughs> but you know good relationship good working relationship with uh, with the IT stakeholders that are absolutely key to making this a success that's why right. so we spoke a little bit before around probably in this case if you're looking at a large organization implementing an, an enterprise level system which is what you know, you've done historically that you would need some external resources you know maybe not completely outsource it but you're going to need some external resources to do that so if you're going to do that, you know, what, what mix tends to work best in terms of, you know, what would you typically leave in-house, let's say with the IT category manager or, or whoever's going to be the, the sort of project lead from the procurement side uh, and what is best to outsource? So in this case, a large chunk of the work that relates to that particular tool. And uh, trust me, James, these days the tools are also pretty simple to the way the implementation cycle is or the way the tool is your average person can learn it and do it, provided they have time. The usual cr crunch of the matter is the person from the customer side doesn't have enough time to take up that bandwidth of work. Okay, uh, that's when we ideally require external source. And if there's, it's it is if it's too technical in nature, they definitely need to know the technical aspects. 
but uh, what i see as a resource in most cases is they don't understand the business process at all so that's where the issue start creeping up is because the business is trying to give you the requirement and you just keep talking what your tool does and uh, that's something that you need to keep a look out for when you're hiring an external resource is because he needs to be able to at least uh, communicate or uh, understand what the business requirement is to even implement that particular tool or soft so that is key is what i see so the the external consultant then is really a bridge between the the software provider and uh, and the the company's procurement department in terms of understanding the complete end to end source to contract cycle and and the relationship that that has with functions like account, accounts payable and, and and some of the more administrative side that's right so if an organization then has managed this pretty well, <laughs> it's Fingers a big crossed. assumption, I know, but, if, but, but, but let's, let's say that they've, got to the, they've, they've done the implementation and it's gone reasonably successfully. The system is handed over, there's a sign-off and it moves into the operations phase from the implementation phase. What are the potential issues from that point onwards that are potentially lurking out there if, um, if, if the project manager or if the company at large and their vendor as the partner in this case sort of take their foot off the gas um you know for example if they're if they're struggling to see the payback on the project if that if they're not seeing the savings trickle down or if they're not seeing through the data the, the benefits of having it what typically sort of lies further down the line and what can be done you know pre that phase to be able to prevent that the first and most important thing is change management Okay, so after implementing, uh, the core person who's going to get affected is the end user, whoever's going to use the system. And um, it's it's key that the rest, the phase before that went well. We want, if, if the end user himself is reluctant for the change, then you're looking out for a disaster. It is core, the, it's key that right after going live with the system or the solution, there's a hyper-K period. And during the hyper-K period, it's essential that the end user puts in a few transactions, gets a feel for the system, and provides his feedback. And even if he ha- it's or that he's able to communicate the issues or he's able to give his feedback for betterment of the solution, if it didn't go well or there's some improvements that are required post go life, uh, which usually is shunned upon uh, by a lot of the organizations. Uh, that is key. Out of the change management, again, on the IT side as well, I've seen the IT folks kind of brush off after the hyper kick period, even though there were no uh, transactions or there was no use of the system. So the IT, IT folks are like, I'm done with this, I'm out of this, so I'm gone. So that, that also is another issue. Um, the, the most important piece is uh, leadership. Uh, leadership kind of clicks fancy pictures and cuts the cake for the system being live. And then they're kind of done with it. So they, they, they want to check. They don't come back and check if the system's getting used or not. So we've seen um, cases that work better if there's a deviation from the process of somebody's not used the process or the technology to escalate it to the, uh, to the leadership just so that we have that in, in line for the rest of the project. So you mentioned hypercare, Kartik. Typically, what would be a normal period that would uh, that, that would be a hypercare period? Are we talking a couple of weeks or a couple of months or or even the whole first year? So hypercare is basically uh, on an upper limit of the first two months. I've, I've had hypercare for two weeks as well, depending on what you're deploying. If it's just uh, sourcing an RFP, two weeks is good enough, because uh, but they yeah. need to ensure they put in three or four RFPs at least. So what I do is I, uh, in the hypercap period, on the day that the system is going live, we have a room full of people. We have one particular category or a, 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 a particular uh, project. And we run the project live with all the key stakeholders and we show the results of the system on, in that room of people. So it, it's a true test of whether it's giving you value or not that kind of pumps up people to use the system more. Uh, typically, uh, run a simple category with a reverse option and see the number of savings that you have. So that is a good strategy to ensure that people are excited about the rollout and also want to use the system from there on. And then at the end of the hypercare period, when when the project then, I guess, at that point is 
handed over to procurement operations to manage. So IT are then sort of out of the picture and the vendor is not putting a huge amount of resource, you know, to solve any sort of day-to-day, any any teething problems associated with implementation. How how does the governance work then from that point onwards? I mean, there must be some sort of monthly ops review or there must be some sort of escalation tree in the contract in in, 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 in case... The relationship manager at the at the vendor can't fix a particular issue, or or if the payback for the for the investment is not trickling through. Yeah. So the the next two issues I've seen, uh, James, which re- relate to whatever you've spoken as a fact. One is uh, no money saved, so you're not saved, you're not uh, allocated enough money for support. Or I've seen few RFPs where the customer did not ask for the support contract from the software provider or the implementer. Okay, <laughs> That's a recipe for disaster. <laughs> yeah, so you end up, you go live, and then you don't know what to do after that. Okay, and then yeah. now the software provider is in the driving seat, and he says, no, this is what it's going to cost. <laughs> you get that? So that, that's a big recipe of disaster, like you said. And not having the right team, if there's specific nuances of the tool that, your team has not learned as yet or you don't have an internal resource, it makes sense to have someone for at least six months until you have learned it and you are ready to do it yourself. Okay, so these are two things that I've seen that uh, the support plan as well, like you said, we need to have defined roles of who handles what kind of issues. If there's, it's basically split into three levels, level one, level two, level three. Level ones are, it should be handled by your organization. It's the basic business-related questions or how to use the tool kind of questions, uh, clarification questions. You need to have in-house expertise. Whoever was, whoever was part of the deployment or the implementation, they need to be the people facing. And level two is something that needs to be changed in the system just for it, for it to make make it happen, like a change in the approval flow and things like that. So that could be the partner or somebody who's helping you with the support. Level three is the software provider himself, the guy who you bought the licenses from. So this structure should be there and it should be well defined even before you go live. Else you're you're going to uh, not go, <laughs> you're going to be dead soon. And that would be, I assume, one of the annexes of the contract as part of the service level agreement. Yeah, okay, so. what are the different what are the different phases, you know, depending on the on on the level of seriousness, you know, to, to be able to have an escalation tree. That's right. So my, my final question, Kartik, is what is the typical contract length or, or are, are there even, let me take a step back, are there, are there advantages to go for a shorter length or a longer length contract period with a provider and, and maybe just quickly walk us through the pros and cons of both? Well, uh, now, uh, there's one contract that is going to be the software provider. Another one is typically, so... If you have a, a bunch of consultants who are going to help you with the implementation, that's going to be the implementation contract. Uh, right. The implementation contract is basically going to be uh, through the course of that deployment cycle, whether it's three months or six months or two months. And then you kind of uh, uh, move into the support phase. Okay. So it's good to have one year support. That's what you need to uh, negotiate with the, so with the implementer. Uh, from the software provider standpoint, so they're pretty straightforward. They have a three-year contract. Uh, you need to uh, ensure to see there's the few things in the contract that could kind of trick you off, wherein you end up uh, paying more after you, once you take the tool, if you're not uh, had clarity on the licensing or uh, the different variations in licensing. One is the core creation license, the guy who creates the sourcing project or creates the contract workspace. And another license is kind of a user license, whether it's somebody who's coming in to view the contract or somebody who's coming to just approve it. So these are two different licensing structures that you have. You need to ensure that you validate how many users you need right in the beginning. And the pricing is based on the user uh, count. And that's that's if you're using source to a contract cycle. Uh, the other side of things is uh, how you, the, the cost is defined on the number of documents that are getting transacted from your uh, system, whether it's the number of POs or invoices. So that's another validation that you need to look at. And uh, it's important that you have key matrices set up uh, for you internally as an organization to ensure that you're sticking to those uh, 
those particular thresholds that you've put as costing for your project. Uh, you basically, most of the tools have an out of the box report that you can utilize to see how many licenses are getting used, who are the users using it on a monthly basis. You can, if you're the IT manager or the procurement uh, head who's holding the project, it's better to get those reports to your uh, mail to your mailbox automatically so that you can review them on a constant basis, uh, just so that you're tying up uh, the entire contract together. And that's an important point because I guess all of these software companies will assume that they will make some money through you know non-standard pricing or out of contract costs if your number of users or number of licenses goes up or if you need extra support beyond what's in the contract. Um, or if you need consultancy ongoing, that's typically, it's like when you buy a machine, you know, the, the provider always yeah. makes lots of money on the spare parts. Yeah. And it's the same, I guess, for this too. That's right. So I guess what you, to paraphrase what you've just said, it's in going back to the beginning of the interview, knowing what you really, really want in the words of the Spice Girls right. right from the very beginning is is absolutely critical because otherwise you could get nickel and dimed at the after the contract's been signed if you if you realize there are lots of additional requirements that you've not sort of specced into the contract or into the scope of work that's right so Kartik, thank you very much that's a, a huge amount of information for a, just a very short half hour interview but if anyone is at the beginning of their journey in digital transformation and really just wants to get an overview of what they need to look out for and some of the common slip-ups and things to things to consider i think this is an absolute solid gold bomb of value that you've just delivered so thank you so much for coming on the show just before i let you go if you could just let the listeners know where they could find you if they would like to connect what's the best way to contact you sure thank you so much james for having me on the podcast it's been really fun and you could reach me out on linkedin that's the best way uh to approach me okay Kartik thank you very much uh, and for anyone listening I will spell Kartik's name in the show notes so as you can uh, hook up with him on LinkedIn if you've got any questions that you'd like to send thanks again Kartik pleasure talking to you look after yourself keep in touch and speak to you soon take care James nice talking to you that wraps up another great interview and I'm really grateful that Kartik came on the show because he has a wealth of knowledge in this space before we sign off if you're feeling a little bit lost and don't really know where to start in terms of understanding what type of solutions are out there and what's the best fit for your organization or even if you're not sure what your specific pain points are and looking for a little bit of initial guidance, why not set up a free 30 minute initial consultation with me so as we can go through all of that and try and give you that little bit of extra clarity before you then go to the business and look at budgets and RFIs and RFPs. Just go over to bookme.name forward slash James Meads or just click on the link in the show notes and yeah, let's speak. I would love to hear from you. Chat to you again next week. Thanks for listening. Bye for now. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the ProcureTech podcast. If you like the show, then please subscribe or even better, why not write us a quick review on Apple Podcasts? It would not only really make my day, but it would also help our mission to enable procurement and finance leaders to become more data-driven through the power of digital transformation. <laughs>